Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us today for our webinar on organ donation facts and myths. This is the first event in a series about advanced care planning of which organ donation is a critical part. My name is Lillian. I'm the Director of Outreach and Education for End of Life Choices New York. End of Life Choices New York is a nonprofit with the mission to expand end of life options, improve end of life care, and promote health care equity at the end of life. We do this through educating the public and healthcare professionals about end of life planning options and rights by providing support for individuals and families navigating the end of life and by advocating for legislation to improve patient care and expand options. We are joined by Scott, Senior Manager of Community and Government Affairs for Live On New York. Live On New York is a nonprofit organization committed to helping New York live on through organ and tissue donation and to caring for families touched by donation. They serve as the federally designated organ procurement organization for the greater New York City area. They facilitate organ donations, take care of families who loved ones have donated, educate the community about organ donation and advocate for those waiting for a transplant. After Scott's presentation, there will be an opportunity to have your questions answered. If you have a question, please type it into the Q&A box at any time. Scott, I turn it over to you. Thank you very much, Lillian. We're very excited to be a part of today's presentation. Uh, especially being April is Donate Life Month. It's the, the one time of the year where we really kind of get out there and bring the topic of organ donation to the forefront. Uh, so this collaboration uh, with End of Life Choice in New York was just perfectly timed uh, and really couldn't be more appropriate from our perspective. Um, so I'm gonna share my screen. I have a couple of slides I'd like to share as we go through and start talking a little bit about our organization uh, and then the organ donation process. And I think uh, Lillian referenced it. We'll start talking about some of the myths and misperceptions and maybe get some of those questions that have been sort of nagging at you out of the way. So let me just share my screen really quickly. And I've got a brief video. Hopefully I did this right. All right. Organ donation is quite remarkable. It brings life to those whose lives are in peril. It brings comfort pride, and even joy to those who are saddened by loss. It enriches the legacy of those who selflessly give. We, Live On New York, are the guardians of this remarkable cause for the 13 million New Yorkers we serve. With warmth, positivity, and expertise, we champion it. We are clinicians, educators, social workers, and more who believe in and are united around the amazing power of donation. With passion and perseverance, day and night, 365 days a year, we work to ensure that the impact... So, as the video is insinuating, Live on New York and Lillian touched upon is one of 57 federally designated organ procurement organizations in the United States each of us with our own unique territory that we'll talk about a little bit here as far as our territory, uh, but also each with a, a rather specific mission when it comes to organ donation, uh, transplantation, and healthcare in the United States. As you can see here, basically for Live on New York, we look to work with local hospitals to identify potential donors when the instances arise, but then also transplant centers to identify the most, uh, most in need when it comes to recipients. And we'll talk about that as far as how one gets onto the transplant wait list uh, and what's entailed in receiving a transplant. In addition to working to identify potential donors and recipients, we also work with families of organ donors. Uh, most folks you would think of to sign up to become an organ donor through the DMV, but that's not always the case. Uh, and oftentimes families are asked if they would like to consent on behalf of a loved one to donation. So we work with those individuals to provide grief counseling, uh, group support, really to provide everybody with an opportunity to engage uh, and share a, a common bond as far as getting through the grieving process and remembering those who so selflessly donated uh, through organ donation. We also look to educate the community about the power of donation. Uh, as you might imagine, organ donation is not something that's frequently thought about or discussed, uh, except for opportunities such as today that present themselves. Uh, so we really look to try to bring it to the forefront so that people start thinking about it. What does it mean to become an organ donor? What would it mean to need an organ transplant? Uh, and that's really a big focus for our organization to get that conversation going. Uh, and as we get through this presentation, I think we'll learn why that's so important, uh, specifically here in the New York area. And finally, we advocate on behalf of those who are waiting for a transplant. Uh, at any given moment in the United States, there's upwards of 110,000 people who are waiting for a life-saving transplant. 
And we really view those as our prime constituents, the people who are in need of that life-saving transplant. Uh, and how can we improve the processes on the participation rates in the country to help get them the transplant they need in a more timely fashion. I mentioned before that each of us have our own service area, all 57 of us. This is pretty much just a quick overview of where the area live on New York serves. Uh, as you can see, it's pretty much all of New York, south of, uh, of Poughkeepsie and Newbury areas, basically, uh, and even Pike County in Pennsylvania. So we've got the city and Long Island. Essentially, we have a 13 county service area with a population of about 13 million people. Within that service area and within the state as a whole, our organization for the past 40 years or so has managed to facilitate over 27,000 life-saving organ transplant surgeries and improve the lives of almost 600,000 individuals through tissue donation. And we'll get into the differentiations as we move through the presentation. In addition to working with those who are in need of organ and tissue transplants, we've also helped to enroll over six and a half million organ donors in New York State. Uh, and while that sounds like a fantastic number, I think we'll realize exactly why there's plenty much more plenty more work that can be done when talking about enrolling organ donors. And as I also mentioned before, a population of over 13 million with 12 counties in New York and the 13th county in Pennsylvania. So even with all that being said, there's still a lot more that we need to do. Only 43% of eligible New Yorkers are registered to be organ donors. This compares with a nationwide average of about 63%. Uh, as a result, New York ranks pretty much dead last or 49th amongst the 50 states when it comes to organ donor enrollment and consent. Uh, and when you combine that, that can result in significant issues for healthcare when low registration rates really do result in an organ shortage. Um, due to the shortage, we have people who have to wait for their transplants much longer than the national average, um, upwards of seven years for a kidney transplant in certain circumstances. And unfortunately for many individuals, the wait is just too long. And on average, a New Yorker dies every day waiting for that. So with that arm, with that little basic background information, what is it exactly that individuals can do? Well, first and foremost, they can sign up to become organ donors. Uh, as you can see from the screen here, the, the first, uh, the primary indicator of organ donation is New York State Department of Motor Vehicles. Folks think of that when they go to renew their driver's license or sign up for their permit. They do make the decision to become a donor or not. Uh, and that's been a tremendous driver of organ donation. Probably 80% of those who enroll enroll through the Department of Motor Vehicles. However, because of that low enrollment rate in the state, New York State's added multiple opportunities for additional ways to become an organ donor. Uh, New York is the only state when someone registers to vote, they can also sign up to become an organ donor. Additionally, you'll see in the lower left corner there, New York State of Health or the Health Benefits Exchange. Uh, this was an addition about two years ago when everything went up online. Individuals who sign up for their health insurance through New York State will see the question when prompted to become an organ donor. And the answer is either yes or no, not at this time. And frankly, that question has to be answered. There's no skipping the question. Uh, the application and the submission can't be processed until that question is answered. Additionally, you can see kind of just the diversity of portal, of portal access that we're looking for. In the upper right corner, this says the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation. That actually references any time an individual in the state now, in, starting in 2021, applies for a hunting or fishing license, actually, believe it or not, they'll be asked if they'd like to become an organ donor. Uh, and there's plenty more new portals that are on the way. Uh, most likely through legislation this year, it'll be added to people uh, when people file their taxes online, uh, when students apply for uh, TAP or Pell funding for college, uh, as well as access to any number of benefits through New York State. Additionally, you see on the lower left, lower right corner there, Donate Life New York State, which is essentially the health registry. You can go online at any given moment. And before we're done today, I'll definitely type the address into the chat and sign up to become an organ donor online. It's just that simple. So all that being said, as far as ways to become a donor, what does it actually mean to potentially become an organ donor? This highlights as far as the impact that one donor can have. Uh, one donor can save up to eight different lives through organ donation. And that can be done, as you'll see on the left, through the heart, two lungs, a liver, two kidneys, intestine or pancreas. Additionally, life, life can be improved for up to 75 individuals through tissue transplantation. And through tissue, we include eye and cornea, which absolutely does restore the gift of sight. Uh, tendons, anytime an athlete perhaps they say blows out a tendon or is gonna be sidelined with an ACL, they're gonna receive a tendon transplant most likely. Then again, there's heart valves with people I'm sure are familiar with, but larger veins and bones in the legs and arms. And I think most folks, when they think tissue, think skin, uh, which is most frequently used for burn victims, but also help in, in the healing process for much many uh, different types of reconstructive surgery. We've talked about the folks who are waiting nationally. We've talked about what could be donated. What does it actually mean when we start drilling down here in the New York area? Uh, and you can see right now, at any moment, there's about 9,000 individuals who are waiting for that transplant. Almost 8,000 of those are waiting for a kidney transplant. The number is, is extraordinarily high. Uh, and again, that can result in an extraordinarily long wait. You'll also see the number of rough, just to give perspective as far as folks who are waiting for a liver transplant, heart, and then lungs. 
And again, there's also folks waiting for pancreas and intestine transplants in, in, in the process. I don't wanna shine a little bit of light as far as how organ donation happens, um, because a lot of folks think that they signed up and they'll automatically become an organ donor. But the reality of it is that only about 1% of people who enroll to become organ donors will ever actually become organ donors. And that's because of the specificity of circumstances that have to occur just in order to become an organ donor. Um, it's very important to notice here that really an organ eye and tissue donation only happens when a patient dies in a hospital, has been declared by a doc, dead by a doctor. Um, we'll get into some of the myths and misperceptions, but it definitely warrants clarification, I think, on this to kind of build faith or, and make sure that there's a clear separation between healthcare and hospital workers and organizations such as ours, each of us with a different focus, but we, who work as a partnership. First and foremost, a patient must be signed up or should be signed up as an organ donor. Uh, and our organization, when notified, will look into that to see if somebody was in fact signed up to be a donor. Uh, if they're not signed up to become a donor, oftentimes we'll also approach the family to say, or to, to share with them some information and see if they'd be willing to consent on behalf of that loved one. Because again, with only 43% of the eligible, pop, eligible population signed up, not all of us get around to it. And a lot of times the family will definitely take solace and, and see comfort in knowing that their loved one has lived on through organ and kidney, organ and tissue donation. The key factor here for organ donation is a candidate for donation must be placed on a ventilator prior to a declaration of death. And this happens in certain circumstances such as drug overdose, asphyxiation, stroke, but again, not all circumstances. And this is gonna result in an eventual declaration of brain death. And I'm sure that everyone here is familiar that's significantly different than cardiac death, which really are the majority of deaths in this country. Again, narrowing that pool of potential donors and further reducing the number of instances where someone can qualify to become an organ donor. Very, very, very important here to note that if any of these circumstances are not in place, there will not be organ donation. This requires a declaration of brain death, connection to a ventilator, and location in a hospital with hospital staff standing by. As far as who gets an organ transplant, we just like to highlight this because again, a lot of this is probably common sense to everyone here, but certain conditions, and a lot of these conditions you'll see not all and not most, but a lot can be prevented. And that's why we like to try and highlight this in our role, perhaps in public health discussions, that we cannot just help folks get the transplant they need, but we like to work with organizations that help to make sure that folks don't even need that transplant in the first place. Diabetes and hypertension can certainly result in the need for a kidney transplant. Uh, untreated hepatitis, cirrhosis can require a liver transplant, and certain types of cardiomyopathy and congestive heart failure will require a heart transplant. Again, several of these conditions are preventable. With that being said, what happens when perhaps somebody has one of these diagnoses or finds themselves in a position to get placed onto the transplant waiting list? The, the process is relatively straightforward. First, they'll get a referral to a transplant program. In our service area right here, we have 11 different transplant programs spanning from um, the farthest north for us is in Westchester County, but then down through the city and out onto Long Island, Suffolk County. Once they select the transplant program, the transplant center is going to gather information on them to not just make sure that physically they're able to get through the surgery and, to with, and endure the wait for that transplant, but also what's important here to note is emotionally. As I indicated, several of the conditions that can lead to a transplant are preventable or could have, be, could have been avoided through proper diet and health care. So an emotional workup is going to be significant to make sure that if somebody is selected to be put on the transplant wait list, and if they do get that transplant, they're not going to squander that opportunity. With that second chance at life, they will live healthy, clean and committed to the, the, for their well-being. Uh, so that's a big component is this, again, this psychological analysis and evaluation. Once all that happens and someone's been evaluated as a prime candidate for transplant, they'll get listed uh, and they'll be put on this list and that where they could wait again nationwide, maybe two to three years for a transplant, up to five years perhaps for a kidney. But again, because of that shortage in New York, we see people who are on the transplant wait list upwards of seven years waiting to get a kidney transplant. Uh, and dialysis is not meant to be a cure or a remedy. It's a stopgap. And five to seven years on dialysis really can take a toll on the body. So we obviously try to get folks to move up that list as fast as we can, as best we can, and to identify as many donors as we can. I like to include this because I think it'll tie into some of the conversations we have later about myths and misperceptions as far as how are donated organs matched to the recipients. And these four bullets you see here are pretty much the primary considerations. Obviously, there's more as far as genetic matching. Uh, and then we can dive much, much deeper into health, health conditions uh, and testing. But really, first and foremost is blood type, just as blood donation would matter. But then also body mass. As large or as small as we are on the outside, so are we on the inside. Uh, so it's very important that like match to like when finding a transplant recipient and donor. Then that, that comes into consideration rank on the national transplant waiting list. 
where are you on this list? How long have you been on the list? How is your health holding up? How likely are you to make it much longer without getting that transplant? And then very significantly for us here in the New York area, geographic proximity between donor and the recipient. Um, once an a donor is identified uh, and recovery surgery takes place, for something like a heart or kidneys, or not, not, not kidneys, excuse me, heart and lungs, you have upwards of maybe four hours where the, the, the organ can survive and can be considered healthy outside of it, a body. So we've got about four hours to facilitate recovery surgery, transport that organ, and then actually have the transplantation surgery take effect. So geographic proximity is paramount in identifying how donors and recipients are matched up. What's very, 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 I can't say very enough here, I guess important, is that organ donation matches are not based upon race, religion, income status, or celebrity. Uh, unfortunately, over the years, certain episodes of Law and Order have not been too kind to our industry, but the reality of it is, again, there's no way to buy your way on the list. There's no way for us to know who you are on the list. An organization such as ours, when we have identified a donor and are looking to match with, with the recipient, we simply get serial numbers and phone numbers. That's all we know. The serial number is the patient and who's waiting. The phone number is their surgeon. We start with number one, call the surgeon, share information, see if they're interested in accepting that organ. If not, we move on to number two and so on and so forth. Again, never knowing who we're contacting or what it is that may be their historical background. Again, that was the primary myth that I thought we should definitely tackle today. But again, I think several of these will sound very familiar. And I'm sure many of you may be shaking your head like, oh, yes, of course. But for, first and foremost that we hear on a day-to-day -day basis is the doctors won't try as hard to save me. And that's simply not true. There is a very clear delineation between hospital staff and organ procurement organization staff. The hospital staff, they are there for one reason and one reason only, focused to save lives, to help with recovery, and to see the, to it that folks actually get fully recovered and go about their days and their lives. It's only when things appear to be taking a turn for the absolute worst and it appears as though recovery may not be an option, will they notify the organ procurement organization, such as Live On New York. And that's not even a decision they make. There are certain tests in place where they are required by federal law to contact us and let us know that there's somebody who, again, appears to be perhaps approaching a declaration of brain death. And hopefully our organization can get there prior to that declaration to speak with the family and coordinate the potential for donation. Another myth is a lot of folks think that perhaps their organ, organ donation is against their religion. Um, and we'd like to highlight and point out that as you can see here, almost all major religions are supportive of organ donation. From Buddhism to Catholicism, Buddhism to Catholicism, there's not much that actually stands in the way of organ donation. Um, while there are obviously certain concerns as far as time constraints and body integrity, all of those could be accommodated. And certainly most religions will say that even above all else, the opportunity to save another's life is far more important and should be considered first and foremost. Another concern for many people is that perhaps they're too old or too sick to be an organ donor. And the reality of it is that no one is ever too old or too sick. Uh, there is no age limit for organ, eye, and tissue donation. The oldest donor on record in New York is 93 years old. She donated a liver to a 75-year-old just to help everyone maintain perspective. Uh, and that liver is now well over 100 years old, and the recipient continues to live on. But also and to be considered here is that health conditions are not a rule out. Um, even many types of cancer do not preclude someone from becoming a tissue donor. Or, or an organ donor. Even HIV positive is not a rule out. In, the, in, the American, in America now, all HIV positive patients can be considered for donation. The caveat would be that the recipient will also be HIV positive. But again, the reality of it is there's no disease, there's no illness that is an automatic rule out. Another concern that perhaps ties to some religious perspectives is that a normal funeral, an air quote, normal funeral will not be feasible. And that's typically not the case. Uh, it's important to note that this is not, um, you know, a game of operation or anything random or anything disrespectful. Organ, eye, and tissue donation are surgical procedures, and I can assure you our organization and all organizations in this field treat it with the utmost care and respect. Uh, there is really very little that isn't done to accommodate the donor and the donor's family and to make sure that they receive the absolute respect that they deserve as they enter into this process. And again, as I mentioned, it's a surgical procedure, so typically open casket viewing is possible. And Live on New York and all organizations who facilitate donation will work with the family's timeframes and religious perspectives to accommodate burial traditions and timeframes. This is something that we've started to re face recently, I guess, because obviously it's become very, very expensive, unfortunately, uh, to take care of, of afterlife decisions. People are concerned that there's going to be a cost associated with organ donation. And again, once again, the reality of it is, is there is no cost with becoming an organ the decision to sign up is free, and obviously once that decision has been made that someone will become an organ donor, 
all billing ceases, all hospital charges is ceased, stopped, and are then transferred to an organization such as ours. So there is no additional cost for the decision to become an organ. I mean, this is basically the most selfless of all acts and the ultimate gift. And the last thing we want to do is put impediments in the way that could perhaps prohibit or be a detriment or deter anyone from signing up to become an organ donor. With that being said today, I guess what we would say is how could you possibly help? First and foremost is sign up to become an organ donor if you haven't already. If you're just waiting for the right opportunity or perhaps you had questions that hopefully get answered today, hopefully after this you can go forward and sign up to become that organ donor. The second thing we tell people though is once you sign up to become an organ donor, it's absolutely essential that you let your family and loved ones know because they're gonna be by your bedside when somebody from an organization such as ours approaches them and either tells them that yes, you were enrolled to become an organ donor and we are there to honor your last wish or no, you weren't enrolled, but certainly your conditions make it such that you could be a viable donor and somebody could receive, receive the gift of life through your selflessness. So it makes it much easier for that family to know ahead of time, as Lillian talked about as far as healthcare proxies and directives, advanced care directives, to make sure that they know what it is that you want. Either way, yes or no, it just helps with the conversation and helps give everyone peace of mind at that trying moment. Finally, the last thing I would say is if you could help is if you are perhaps touched by a donation, if you are a recipient yourself, uh, if you know somebody or had a family member who was a donor, or you know somebody who's on the wait list currently, you can always volunteer by helping to raise awareness around organ donation. Um, again, those 13 counties and 13 million people, ours is a team of about six, and it's very difficult for us, as you can imagine, to get everywhere all the time. So we rely very heavily on volunteers to help spread the word and share their personal connection and put a human face on donation, talking about what it means to receive that transplant, to be here today because of that. And also importantly, the solace and, and peace that they've received knowing that their loved one became a donor, and as the name indicates, has managed and does in fact live on through organ donation. The last slide I think that I would share with you right now is just to kind of, again, put a face on the people that we work for and with every day. On the left, you see Angelica, who's a young woman from the Bronx, who's currently waiting for a heart transplant. Uh, and while she waits, she is reliant upon an LVAD, a left ventricular assist device, to kind of help the blood, the heart pump and make sure that the blood circulates. She is reliant upon that machine and she will continue to be relying on that machine until she receives her transplant. So every day we're out there advocating for and educating people about conditions and that impact folks like Angelica to hopefully make sure that folks are more inclined to say yes to donation. On the right is probably one of my favorite stories, uh, Detective Anita Moore, who is with the New York City Police Department, uh, Special Victims Unit actually. And she is both a recipient, she received a cornea transplant to ensure that she had restored the gift of sight after an, uh, after an accident. But then also, she is one of the few people in the world who are considered a living donor. I'm sure most folks are familiar with kidney donation. We all have two, you only need the one. So that's a very simple and straightforward process. But also becoming far more popular now is living liver donation because the liver is a phenomenal organ, believe it or not. Uh, Detective Moore was able to donate up to half of her liver. And within a couple of months time, three to four months time, that liver fully regenerated to 100% capacity and, and growth once again. And at the same time, it grew within her father, Cortez, to again, 100% capacity. So now through the one act of kindness, two people have fully functional livers and are enjoying the gift of life. With that being said, I would stop my screen sharing, I think. Thank you so much, Scott. So uh, now it is time to get your questions answered. If you have a question, please put it in the Q&A box. And I see we got some already. Um, first, I'll actually start with a question that we got um, in advance of the webinar. And that is, what is full body donation? And can you be both a full body donor and also donate some organs? Sure, full body donation is definitely a different process. Uh, and we will encounter this on a daily basis. Uh, that is essentially determining ahead of time that you would like your body to go towards research as a cadaver for any one of the, the number of numerous medical schools here in the greater New York City area. Uh, there is a nonprofit organization that pretty much coordinates that for all of them. Uh, it's highly reputable, highly regulated. Um, and again, that basically says that this, you'd like your body to go for research for science, which typically goes to med schools. Um, the one thing I would say about that though is that organ donation and full body donation are not compatible. It has to be either one or the other. However, our two organizations do work together, you know, to again, facilitate whichever is gonna be most advantageous. Uh, typically, they'll tell you that organ donation takes pre prevalence because again, it can result in life-saving surgery for someone. But again, if it's not gonna be feasible, we can certainly coordinate with them to facilitate the full body donation as well. 
And we also received a question about um, advanced directives for research specific donation. Is it possible to, uh, I guess, complete an advanced directive or, or a particular form that specifically indicates that they would like their organs to be donated to science? Yes, actually, it, through the standardized enrollment form in New York State to become an organ donor, there are three questions, three options that have to be considered. One is you would like to be considered an organ and tissue donor for A, research and transplant, B, transplant only, or C, research only. And this provides folks, again, uh, to determine how they'd like their gift to be utilized. Uh, and a lot of that's for uh, emotional per perspectives. But again, also, many folks do make sure that they donate, and it's directed towards research. And much like the organization that facilitates full body donation, we work with numerous different local universities and medical programs to identify people with health conditions where perhaps that transplant or that donated organ could be of benefit for the research process. Mm. We also received a question specifically about Ulster County. Is that a county that your organization covers or is that a different group? It's actually a different OPO or organ procurement organization. And I, I perhaps I probably should have been more specific. In, in the state of New York, there are actually four of us that each cover a different territory. And so to the north, we have Ulster and they go all the way up to the, the Canadian border and into Vermont. Uh, and then there are two more organ procurement organizations that cover central New York state and then the western most part of the state. So there is an organization that does exactly what we do for you. It's just not our organization. Um, I think that this next question uh, goes back perhaps to the research question specifically about brain donations. Uh, it sounds like that's only within a research setting and, and is that something that would also be managed separately? That is managed separately from our organization. Again, all of us obviously operate in the same field, the same space and we collaborate. Uh, but brain donation is becoming more and more prevalent over the years. Uh, and the, my, the most proximate is the Brain Institute, which is actually housed, I believe, up at the Bronx VA, but is, done in, is managed in coordination with Mount Sinai. Uh, and that is, yes, that would be purely for research. And again, we are seeing that more and more frequently these days. Uh, but it is a, a, an amazing program where, where the brain can be donated and analyzed and studied for future research studies. Oh, interesting. There's a question. Um... So you mentioned in your presentation that one of the requirements for donation is that you are um, on a ventilator, it, so presumably in a, in a hospital or, or other medical setting. Mm -hmm. Is there any research into expanding donations beyond those who are in hospitals and on ventilators? Um, I probably should be should clarify that as far as that's for organ donation itself, that, and that's there's really not much that can be done because actually the ventilator perpetuates oxygenation and blood flow. Uh, the minute that is discontinued, the organs are not considered viable for transplant. And again, I'm speaking in broad terms, but also tissue donation can be feasible for any type of death, cardiac or brain death declaration. And you'll actually have a window of up to 24 hours. So we definitely typically do work with certain hospice care organizations, even specific funeral homes, who know that perhaps that was part of the desired wishes of, of, of the decedent is that they would have liked to become a tissue donor. And we do have a 24 hour or a full day window to which we can work to recover tissues. Again, eyes, corneas, bones, uh, and tissue. So donation is still purely feasible, 100% feasible. Uh, and there is still that, that, that gift that can be given um, regardless of where, the, where, where things take place. But yes, for organ donation, it's still very, very, very specific. And it's as the technology stands right now, I don't think we see any type of change in the near future regarding that connection to a ventilator, declaration of brain death, surgery taking place in the hospital at the same time. Mm. So if someone uh, wants to be a donor, um, but perhaps has, you know, I think you touched on underlying conditions do not automatically rule you out, uh, mm. but they are not currently getting um, any treatment for an underlying con condition. Is there any um, is there anything that they should know? The question specifically is what happens if someone who wants to be a donor is in palliative care, so getting comfort care, but not any kind of potentially curative treatment? Um, what would happen? Would they still be eligible? Actually, yes. I, and again, you can imagine there are certain circumstances that are not conducive to donation. But the one thing we tell everybody is that anybody, anytime, under any circumstances should consider themselves a potential donor, again, for organ or tissue. Um, Again, certain types of cancer, obviously, you would think it's not likely that someone will become a donor, but it's not an automatic rule out. We don't really know until we start working with the hospital or healthcare professionals to really do a full background diagnostic, to take a look at all the health conditions, family history, social history, 
And again, it's very surprising sometimes what we can be identified as viable for donation. So again, while I think common sense could prevail that there are certain types of conditions that would probably not lend themselves to donation, we always tell folks, don't, don't rule yourself out because you just never know. And certainly our organization will find out for sure if there is something that can be done to help save someone or improve someone's life. And then we'll pursue that course of action. Another question is, if I register as an organ donor, but my family does not want me to donate, can they override that decision? That is a rather tricky and uncomfortable question. They're not uncomfortable in that essentially signing up to become an organ donor is a legally binding contract. It is our legal obligation to honor your wish. However, that being said, there have been circumstances where we've gone to the hospital, notified the family that someone wished to become an organ donor, uh, and there's been significant family resistance. Um, we constantly, we try as hard as we possibly can to coordinate with the family to make sure they understand, uh, to find ways to verify that your decision was made freely and, and you know, of sound mind. Um, but I think at the end of the day, the last thing anybody wants to do is take a difficult situation and make it more difficult. So certainly between us and our hospital partners, we'll do everything we can to try and make the family see your wishes and desires, but also always constant, constantly aware of just how difficult the situation is uh, and the emotions that are running high at that point in time. Mm. I think this touches on another um on another topic, and that is going back to advanced directives. So, you know, for individuals who do not have a healthcare proxy form filled out, and this is a form appointing someone you trust to make medical decisions for you if you lose the ability to do so yourself. So if you do not have that form completed, there is a hierarchy under what is called the Family Healthcare Decisions Act about who can make medical decisions for you, essentially surrogate decision maker. Um, is there something similar to that once someone dies? Is there a hierarchy of who gets to decide uh, what happens with their, with their remains? And also, is there a form like the healthcare proxy form, but for appointing a particular person to make these decisions? When it comes to organ and tissue donation, not so much. We recently, and, and again, it's, it's, it's only a 40-year science, actually, but it's, it continues to evolve. Um, but there is a hierarchy of family, correct, uh, without a doubt, uh, that does rank based upon, uh, obviously, as you might think, it, it's a spouse or a parent, and then it could be children or grandchildren. Uh, and the laws were just modified last year to actually kind of expand that to sort of recognize the changing times that we have in here, that, that we live in, uh, as far as adult children, perhaps taking care of grandparents or grandparents taking care of younger children, uh, domestic partners, even longtime friends have been, the rights have been expanded to accommodate their consent assuming that there's nobody else in the hierarchy available. Um, so there is always a preferred hierarchy through New York State uh, for donation. But again, there is, a, I think there's eight different family classes that we can work our way through. Uh, and, and again, to try and facilitate the, the last wishes of, of, of your loved one or friend or colleague. I hope I answered that. Yes, I think you did. And I think there's also, uh, we had heard of a form, I, I think it's called appointment of agent to control disposition of remains or something like that. Um, and so I, I don't know much about it, but I, I'd be happy to, for those interested to also see if I can find that form and email it to everyone in case that comes up. Um, thank you, that was, that was very helpful. Um, another question we got uh, was if you could expand a little bit more on exactly what tissue donation is. Sure, I think tissue, folks have different things that they envision. So I'm glad that someone asked so we could talk about it. Um, tissue, we say it, it includes but also bone and eye. Um, even though it, depending upon the vernacular, how you want to phrase things, but tissue from our perspective includes eyes and corneas, which again are given to, to those who, to restore sight. Uh, tissue can include heart valves um, as well as um, larger veins. Larger veins on our legs, believe it or not, can be recovered and are utilized for transplant for people who suffered severe accidents. Um, also bone falls underneath that category to some extent because bones in, in the arms and legs for people who have been in, a, in an accident or certain types of bone cancer. We will transplant a bone to help with the restore the function of the limb. Um, but then also I think what folks most commonly think of as tissue is literally tissue. It, it's, it's fatty tissues from parts of our body from our backside, our legs that can be recovered and will be utilized to help individuals to either recover from a burn or other types of surgeries. Um, very frequently now it'll be used for um, mastectomy recovery because really the tissue is not a permanent fix. It, it's, 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 a band it's nature's band-aid. Uh, it, it will molt just like our own skin does and is there to help with the recovery as best possible. 
So it, it's comes in, you'll see it using more and more frequently now, again, in, in reconstructive surgeries as well. Thank you for that. That's really helpful. Um, another question we got is, can I specify which organs I wish to donate? Absolutely. I showed you that chart, I think, earlier that had the, the eight different organs, and there's about eight different tissues that are viable for donation. Uh, and when enrolling in New York State, it, when either doing it online or in the paper form, there is a box to check off either, yes, I'd like to donate this or that, or not donate this or that, um, that does give people the opportunity to select. And a lot of that, I think, could be perhaps for emotional reasons. Um, a, a lot of people are, are, will check off, they don't wish to donate their eyes. Uh, that's one thing we've noticed over the years. Um, but yes, people can actually select which organs and tissues they would like to be considered for transplant. So in addition to the providing the information that yes, you wanna be a donor, you can say, these are the organs and tissues that I would or would not like to be transplanted. And then these are the conditions I'd like them to be transplanted under again, the, for, for, for life-saving transplant research or both. Thank you, Scott. Also, um, uh, another question about uh, specific choices for donation is, can I choose who my organ goes to? This is kind of an interesting question because really, as we, I think we mentioned before, we like to, it, it's, it, donation happens regardless of, of religion, race, creed, things of that nature, celebrity status. However, we have had circumstances where there is perhaps a, a young adult or, or any family member who is going to be considered for deceased donation. If the family consents on their behalf, we will allow them, if they have a friend or family member specifically that they know of who is in need, they can direct those organs for transplant. And this did happen somewhat recently here in New York, uh, a young man, unfortunately, uh, and the mother, it was actually remarkable, I believe, uh, there was a, an aunt who needed a kidney and there was a match and she received a kidney. And there was even a friend of the family who was waiting for a heart transplant and the heart went to him as well. So again, while you can't specify, like I only want people from this neighborhood or this, this nationality, if you have friends or family members and you are able to make that decision on behalf of a loved one when, when considering deceased donation. And there's a question about um, how to register if you're interested in becoming a living donor. Living donation is very unique. And I can honestly, I, I don't know if I drew the line clearly enough. Our organization does not participate in that. Our, we are solely focused on deceased donation, acting as that intermediary between hospital and transplant center. However, again, of the 11 different transplant centers in our area, all are always very anxious to identify potential living donors. So I would say it's a matter of really determining where you would be comfortable making that decision. If there's, and that's a purely altruistic of which there are only a couple hundred people each year who just decide, you know what? There are people out there who are desperately in need of a kidney or a liver transplant. I'd like to make the donation. It's simply a matter of identifying a program and letting them know. They all have hotlines. They all have a page on the website saying, yes, I'm interested in becoming a living donor. Uh, and certainly we can share information um, with, with you, Lillian, or that you could dis disperse to the folks who are watching today. Uh, for each of the different programs that we have here in the city and in the suburban areas that do focus on living transplant and how they look to facilitate that. That would be great. Um, sure. Yes, after the, the webinar, probably this afternoon, I'll get a chance to send everyone an email with the link to the recording, as well as um, links to certain um, any materials and, and our sites that are referenced that you can follow up. Um, there's a question going back to, to specifics around organs, which reproductive organs can be transplanted? There have been successful uterus transplants um, and there have been penis transplants. There are, have been, I'm trying again, and these are tend to be on the, the outliers and not frequently occurring. Um, but yes, we are very, very aware of, of uterus transplants. Um, and as well as, again, I make, mentioned those eight primary organs, that's pretty much the, the day to day, but just recently, there was an article in the paper at Mount, uh, Mount Sinai, I believe, the first um, trachea transplant. Um, I mean, so the science continues to expand and the opportunities. Right now, what we find ourselves involved with, which is really fascinating, is full facial transplants. Uh, it's not considered an organ. It's not considered a tissue. It's considered a VCA or vascularized composite allograft because there's so much that goes into it uh, in the reconstruction of a, of a face and a tongue, uh, even implementing components of 3D printing to help reproduce cartilage in an ear. So I, again, I presented a very introductory level, I think, conversation on organ donation. But when you start digging much deeper, you can see that there are many, many more possibilities. Mm. That, that touches on a, another question we received uh, in advance. 
In the age of 23 and me, more and more genetic information is being shared. If I donate an organ, does the recipient have the right to share my genetic information? If you donate an organ, the recipient, it's, it's still a blind process. And I wanna make sure I understand the question. So if I don't, please correct me or push me back in the right direction. Um, we act as a sort of an intermediary. We know who the donor is, we know who the recipient is, but we're not allowed to really share that information with anyone. Um, we facilitate that frequently. Donors will look to write a letter to the recipient and we kind of handle that to kind of create that, that barrier and that anonymity. Uh, so they will write a letter reaching out to the recipient, send, submit it to the hospital, the hospital will give it to us, we'll present it and share it to the recipient. And if they choose to reply, we'll facilitate that connection uh, and the same for recipient. Um, but other than that, there's really no way to identify a potential, you know, who your donor may be or to figure out who the recipients may be. And again, I hope I answered that question properly. So if not, please let me know. Sure. I think perhaps, and what you said was really helpful. Um, I think perhaps the, the question is touching on, you know, since an organ possesses the genetic material of the donor, um, you know, if there was, for example, a research study, or in this case, 23andMe, which is a, a commercial product, where it was possible to test the genetic material in that, I suppose probably the it would be difficult to do that for an organ. I think probably, you know, if there was a bone marrow transplant in blood, that's a bit easier. But um, whether the recipient has the has the right to share genetic information about their donated organ, I guess is the question. I don't, I, that may be an issue, I think, of perhaps science moving faster than legislation. I mean, there's no preclusion of, of that as far as I'm aware. Um, and again, because it still guarantees a really high degree of anonymity. Um, so I, I don't think there at this point in time would be any type of preclusion for sharing that information uh, with, with, with a genetic database. Thank you. That's really helpful. Um, another question we got, um, and I think this goes back to eligibility. Um, if an organ recipient passes away, could the transplanted organ be donated again? Specifically the transplanted organ, no, but just being a recipient by no means precludes someone from being a donor. Uh, and specifically why this can't really occur is because organ transplant, organ recovery and transplant surgery, they are surgeries. And so there's going to be some degree of scarring and scar tissue that develops. So really through the recovery process and then transplant process, that, that organ wouldn't be considered uh, optimal for recovery and transplant once again, because of, you know, it does sustain a, some degree of scarring and damage during the process. Mm. Um, another question we received as well, uh, you mentioned volunteering as a way to get involved and they're interested in learning more about volunteer opportunities. Oh, well, I can certainly share information. I'll put it in the chat as far as my information, if someone would like to contact me directly or as, or look, some more information on our website as well. That's my Thank email you. in the chat. That's the website for our organization. And if somebody would like to go online and enroll as a donor today, that's the link that links you to the New York State Department of Health. Oh, that's great. Thanks for including that. Um, let me see. Another question we got. Um, oh, if I note that I want to be an organ donor on the healthcare proxy form, should I still register? I would say yes. Uh, again, the more way, the more times you can say yes, the more certainty it creates. I kind of think it maybe it speaks to that topic, uh, the question before, as far as someone enrolling and family objecting. We prefer to maintain as much certainty as possible. So I would say absolutely, not just enough to perhaps enroll as a donor, but then to enroll as a donor and have yes on the healthcare proxy, basically just to eliminate any and all doubt uh, and to provide family comfort. So I would, in my opinion, there's never enough ways or times to enroll or to make sure people know that it's something that you're interested in. Mm. Um, another question, uh, going back to the questions we received in advance, um, was around disparities and whether you could speak to any, um, they don't say sp which specific disparities, but perhaps racial or other disparities in um, both uh, signing up to be a donor as well as uh, recipients. Absolutely. And again, because it couldn't really be more timely. And I think it really speaks to why New York itself has an issue when it comes to donation because of the diversity that we have. And because of very specific populations that we have that for traditional cultural historical reasons are not necessarily supportive of donation. That doesn't mean that they oppose donation. And this is on the donor side. We can talk about the recipient side as well. Um, certainly the black and African-American populations for, for obvious reasons through mistreatment, you know, as recently as 20, 30 years ago with the American healthcare system, 
are skeptical. And this is not done necessarily anecdotally. We've done focus group testing and trying to identify barriers to donation. Um, in addition to that, we find that there are several populations um, that still remain concerned that perhaps their religion does not support donation. Uh, and to that end, organizations such as ours have uh, members of the clergy on staff full time to probably try to address those concerns. So if we have someone who believes that their religion does not support it, we can typically try to have somebody uh, of, of the similar faith background speak to them and try to provide the, the background that they're looking for to be more comfortable with that decision. That's on the donor side. So yes, we, we definitely have certain populations and certain ethnicities and religious groups that are, are hesitant to, to, to approach donation. As far as public health disparities on the recipient side, it's yes, uh, of the, the 9,000 people in New York who are waiting for a transplant, goodness, uh, I think 75% are can be considered black and brown. Um, it, it, the numbers are, are terribly disproportionate um, as far as people who are waiting for that transplant and, and the people you know who, who are making up the population. The only one thing I can say as a positive of that is because we do track um, racial background, a racial makeup of our donor pool, but also of recipients is that it's always disproportionately tilting towards minority communities on the receiving side as well. Um, because there are so many people who are awaiting that transplant, without a doubt, by zip code, we will see that the community receiving the transplant is also largely comprised of minority populations. So there is that equity there as far as, it's not that any one race or group of people benefits more so than any other, but again, certainly several groups are more disproportionately reflected on that enrollment or that waiting list uh, while they're awaiting that transplant. Thank you, Scott. Um, another question. Ah, yes. So you mentioned um, earlier about uh, having letters shared between um, recipients and donor families. Um, and so the question is asking about, um, let's see, yes, how, how that connection may get facilitated, you know, I, I know that you're, you mentioned what information could and couldn't be shared, but if both sides are open to it, you know, I think, I think that they're alluding to photographs that we've seen online of, you know, someone listening to the heart of their loved one who's passed in, in a recipient. And so what, how might that connection be established? Uh, yeah, I, and we, we, we love trying to make those connections happen, just like there's a team here that's dedicated to community affairs and awareness, such as myself and, my, and the group I work with. We have a team called Donor Family Services, uh, and they work specifically with the families of donors. Uh, and they do, uh, and that can be through identification of the recipients of their loved one's organs. And they act as an intermediary. Again, um, it, and it's frequently more so, I believe, on the recipient side. You'll see the recipient is very curious to know more about their donor. So wherever they receive their transplant, they will share a letter. And it is basically done as a letter um, just to keep it basic and, and start the conversation process. Uh, the transplant program will then notify our organization because even the hospital or the transplant program doesn't necessarily know where that organ came from or who was the donor. So they will share that information with us and then we will pass it along to the donor's family. And that's pretty much where we take our hands off approach and let the donor's family decide if they'd like to pursue this connection. Um, if they would, they need to return or reply to that letter or that written correspondence. Uh, and then we facilitate the conversation back and forth for two or three different pieces of written correspondence. And then ultimately, if the parties are interested, we will coordinate a reunion or a meeting if, if that's something that they are all interested in. And, and it does happen. I will say this, it doesn't happen that frequently. More often than not, there is resistance on one side or the other, maybe 25% of the cases where we find that there's a connection made between both sides of the donation. That's great. Uh, oh, let's see, we have another question going back to advanced directive. If you have a DNR in place, so a do not resuscitate order, does it rule out organ donation since you are asking not to be put on a ventilator? And the two are not incompatible. I think the condition, because actually you would have to be placed on the ventilator before it was determined that death was imminent, if that makes sense. So it wouldn't, it, you certainly wouldn't right. put on a vent simply to sustain for the donation, but if you were already ventil on a ventilator, then the two can be compatible. Oh, that makes sense, yes. Okay, so if they already, so they, so no one would be put on a ventilator solely to sustain them for organ donation, they would have to have already been put on the ventilator for an independent reason, is that my understanding? Correct, yes, and thank you for explaining it much more clearly than I did, but yes, absolutely. Um, 
Let me see. Uh, oh, yes. Yeah, so the other question was about how to register, which you included, and that's great. Okay, so we've only got a few minutes left. If there are any remaining questions, please put it in the Q&A box. See. Just give everyone another moment. In the meantime, uh, do you have any uh, final thoughts or information that you'd like to share, Scott? Uh, again, just to remind everyone that we're in the last few days of Donate Life Month, so it's definitely a great time to start thinking about it or have a conversation with someone. Uh, and, and again, obviously, we're advocates. We believe that organ donation is, is beautiful, um, but there's no right or wrong answer. But I would definitely, again, tell anybody who's listening today, make sure that your loved ones know, because when the time for the decision to be made, you're not going to be able to participate in that conversation. And it really just does take such a burden off of the family members or the friends that we surrounding to know what your wishes were, rather than to have to wonder what would they want or how could I best honor them. So that's always, I think, our, our number one uh, piece of information for everyone is, sure, we'd love you to sign up, but regardless, make sure that your friends and family know your decisions just to take that burden off of them when the time comes. Thank you, Scott. And then I echo that as well. With all advanced directives, please talk to your family and friends and loved ones about what your wishes might be. It, you know, if you lose the ability to make these decisions for yourself, and certainly in the case of organ donation, it's a critical piece. And, um, and of course, feel free to reach out to us at End of Life Choices New York. I'll send you the link to our website as well as Live on New York's website if you have any questions about completing advanced directives. And we, we um, are so happy to have this conversation with you, Scott, because we often get questions specifically about organ donation on the healthcare proxy form. And so I hope today has been informative and, and I'm looking forward to continuing the conversation with you as well. I will be sending an email to everyone who registered with links to your organization's websites, the forums referenced today and information about upcoming events. I hope you will join us again soon. Have a wonderful afternoon. Bye-bye.